Ladies and gentlemen, this is somebody who helps people make sense of their dreams. So please give a very warm legacy welcome to our very first speaker, T.K. Coleman. love to do just part of my time talking and a lot of my time talking with you. So I want to open up for you to dialogue with me and ask me any questions that you might have. How does that sound? Does that sound cool? All right. Now, now if you're thinking, oh man, TK, I, I, just, I just like listening to you. You just keep talking. I can, I can keep listening to myself talk, but <laughs> it'd be nice to, uh, to talk with you. So I'm, let's open up. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to come up here with you, bud, if that's okay. Can I say, come? say what? Up? I'm over here. Yep. I'm going to come hang on on stage with you for a minute. Oh, yeah, man. And nothing's um, off limits, by the way. Whatever you want to know. All right. Because if I don't know or want to so, answer it, I'll tell you. So um, has anybody ever seen the Netflix documentary, The Minimalists? A couple of hands. So you have, what, two documentaries yeah. out there on Netflix right now? Yeah. And you guys are coming out with a TV show too, right? Or, so, or it's like a series, isn't it? We're, 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 we're working on it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so you pre-announced it, but we're working on it. You, say, you set me up for failure. No, I'm just kidding. We're in the process of, uh, of pitching it, so we, we hope that we, hope we, get, we get it pitched, man. That's yeah. the goal. So if, and, and I think it's the first ones available like on your website or on YouTube now, yep, the whole thing. Right. So yep. you don't even have to have a Netflix, but, but look up, uh, is it Minimalism or The Minimalists? Yeah, the one on YouTube it's is Minimalism. minimalism. Is yeah. The one on Netflix is called Less Is Now. Yeah, so write those down, check those out. It's TK and his two business partners. And, uh, and if, you, if you watch Less Is Now, you'll realize that I just recently uh, minimized my hair. <laughs> you, you know what, Here, here's something that's crazy. So, Same boat, buddy. Same boat. So, so look, I, you know, I, 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 I traditionally, I, I love just kind of wearing like a uh, old school, like 80s uh, high top fade. And before I, I moved from South Carolina to California, I was like, you know, I have my barber out here. I don't know anybody out there. It's probably gonna be a while before I get to know anybody that I trust with my hair. I just don't feel like the maintenance. I'm just gonna shave and, um, and then I'll figure it out later. I, I'm, I'm good with doing a bald head. You know, I, Michael Jordan, right? He made it cool. And so anyway, I move and uh, my first day in the studio, as I'm walking into the studio, literally right next door is this black barber shop right next to my studio. I'm like, man, so I might have to grow it back <laughs> Could have been easy, hey. Yeah. No, I love it. Uh, funny how the universe responds, right? Yeah, right. Um, when you don't need it, it's right there for you. Yeah, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that really resonated, I mean, first of all, can we give him a round of applause? That was like, so, I'm taking nu nuggets, but I was like, God, I gotta rewatch this. And um, uh, one of the things that really resonated, obviously there's, uh, the show is a lot about you know, physical stuff, right? Uh, at least the first one is. And um, the reason I reach out to you is because I like your take on all these things more so, not saying the other guys, aren't, but like your take is, hey, if it provides value to me, it's okay to have, right? Like I, w I remember you specifically said, hey, I want somebody to sell me things if I need those things, right? Like I'm not saying it's anti-sales or anti-marketing, but like I want those things if I need those things and I want the value out of it. Um, but asking yourself, does this provide value to me? And you took it even a step farther where it's not just about material things and asking, does, does this material thing provide value to me? But does this business provide value to me? Does this relationship provide value to me? And the concept of minimalism is, is beyond um, stuff and the material things. It's, it's many other things that you can take a look and take these principles and implement in other aspects of your life. Hey, do I need to have those negative people in my life? No, if they're toxic, I need to minimize it, right? I need, I need to reduce. Um, and, and I think uh, Leonardo da Vinci has a quote where it's like, perfection doesn't come from looking at how much you can add to something. It's by, by taking away as much as you possibly can, removing as much as you possibly can, and then what's left is, is the closest thing to perfection. That's it, man. I love that. So one quick comment on sales. Um, is I, I think it's actually a, a disservice to humanity to not sell. And unfortunately, media representations, which make good comedy, of salespeople present this uh, depiction of sales as if it's the process of 
twisting people's arms to get them to do things that they don't want to do. Uh, but really, sales is the art of helping people discover solutions that they don't know about to problems that they have. And a good salesperson isn't about twisting arms. In fact, all good salespeople are, are quick to identify who's not for them. Like good qualification is a part of sales. And qualification isn't about dismissing people because they're not of value to you. Qualification is about saying, I am not going to waste someone else's time and I'm not going to waste my time by trying to debate someone into things they don't want or need. But sales is about helping people to discover what they need. Uh, Zig Ziglar said something so beautiful. He, he, he was talking to a, a young salesman and he says, so, you know, the guy sells vacuums. And, and he said, um, so suppose you were, you were talking to someone and, and they told you that they really like your vacuum and really need it, but, you know, they have just enough money for the vacuum and it's, it's the last amount of money they have. What would you tell them? And uh, the, the, the guy says, oh, I, I tell them, no, don't, don't buy the vacuum. And uh, Zig Ziglar says the wrong answer. He says, if that's how you feel, if you're not willing to take someone's last dollar for what you're selling, you either need to get out of the sales business or you need to sell something that you actually believe in. Because if you truly believe in your product, you always believe and you always feel that you are giving that person more value than what they are giving up to acquire it. That you are literally empowering them with that service or with that product to create more wealth in their own lives. So I totally reject this idea that sales is evil. And I also agree with Ziegler's theory that everything is sales, that we're all selling all the time. We're not selling people for money, but even if I'm like, hey, Tim, come to this movie with me, man, I'm telling you, it's so good, the reviews are great, and, and we'll have a good time together. I'm selling him on the idea that hanging out with me is a fun experience and that it won't be a waste of his time. So we're all doing it. It's just about owning it, being honest about it, doing it with integrity, and doing it with something that we believe in. As far as the point about minimalism goes, um, it is absolutely the case that just like with education, so it is with possessions. There's no one right way for everyone, you know? So the example I use with education is someone says, well, should I go to college? I go, well, you answer this question for me. Should I drive, should I walk, or should I fly? I said, oh, where are you going? Exactly, where are you trying to go? I can't give you a prescription and tell you what way you should take if I don't know anything about what you want. So an artist, who is spending a bunch of time painting, might have a whole bunch of things in their home that's like a mess for you or a mess for me, but it's not a mess for them. And so clutter is relative to the individual, to what you need, what makes you come alive, what your mission is, and so on. And so people miss the point of minimalism when they make it about judging what other people are doing with their possessions. It's not about what other people do with their possessions. It's about letting go of the things that hold you back from living the kind of life that you truly want to live. And I consider myself more of a philosophical minimalist where I like to focus on helping people declutter their, their self-defeating beliefs, like mm -hmm. letting go of stories that you're telling yourself that are getting in the way of the health and the fulfillment that you truly want. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've been going on a minimalism journey in like the deals that I'm in, right? And the yeah. businesses that I'm in and the opportunities that are presented to me. It's like, is this gonna provide more value to my life or is it going to add clutter to my life, right? It's not stuff, like I can make more money, right, from that deal, but at what expense? At what expense to my mental health? At what expense to my time? At what expense to my family? Like, and it's, so after, after that, like, you know, obviously I went through the, the stuff and decluttering of stuff too. Like, I got these big ass bins and I told my kids, I was like, you guys fill up these bins with all your toys, all right? Who's got like just loads and loads of toys all around the house, like every room, it spills over. Yeah, even Nick does, he doesn't have kids. <laughs> yeah. okay. And uh, they're just everywhere in my house, right? I'm like, you, you fill up this big bin and I'm gonna get you guys, and I, and I offered my kids like a $50 credit to go to either Target or Walmart in order to get like a new like special toy. But I was able to get rid of all this stuff and get one toy that was this big instead, you know? Yeah. So like we went through that, but now I'm going through the business side of things and relationship side of things and like uh, you know, going through my, my expenses and my profit and loss and just trimming the fat everywhere that I can. Like, like why, uh, why do I have all these expenses on things that I don't even use, right? And things that yeah. don't provide value more so than anything else. And, and we have a couple of microphones, so if anybody has a question, raise your hand while we're talking. 
by the way, it, it's, it's not about morality, although I, I love morality. It's about, op, uh, it's about being optimal. Um, so um, how, how do I put this? The, the defining question of minimalism is how might my life be more with less, right? So um, as Rami Seti likes to say, what is your rich life? And everyone's rich life looks different. But what does meaningful abundance look like for you? And then what do you need to get out of the way in order to, to go about that? It's not this legalistic, moralistic thing where you say, oh, uh, I need to declutter because it's this objectively correct way to live independently of any kind of higher point of reference. You know? So one way that, that I think uh, minimalism is very valuable for people is learning how to minimize the amount of things you say yes to. Right, so, and it has nothing to do with like, oh, this is just the one right way to live. But so many people fail to live the lives they truly wanna live because they're just indiscriminately giving away yeses. I'll say yes to that project, I'll say yes to that person, I'll say yes to that deal. And the people that are happiest, the people that thrive the most, they tend to be very precise about their no's. They give out a lot of no's, they don't do a lot of things, not because they don't do a lot. They don't do a lot of things so that they can do a lot with the things that really matter. So that's really what it's about. All right. I mean, yep. think, think back to like yep. when COVID happened and, and not mm -hmm. talking about the political side of it, not talking about the health side of it, but just like everything shut down. You couldn't go to events. You couldn't yeah. celebrate holidays. Like, and like, uh, it's where a lot of the efficiencies and actually my business came to be because we had to figure out how to go online and then we were able to reduce prices and then we were able to expand and, and, and impact more people. And it was kind of nice not having all that stuff, yeah. right? And then yeah. it all gets piled back on. Um, but it's, it, it, it was a, a little taste of what you're talking about. Chris yeah, Lamb, I see you, you got a question about Yeah, so TK, you talked about, you know, being vulnerable. And I think that, you know, being a man, you know, a head of the household whose responsibility is to provide, procure, you know, in order to grow, you have to be vulnerable. But, you know, personally, I struggle with being vulnerable. How do you, how do you teach that? So there's a difference between a state of consciousness and the um, gestural vocabulary we use to express that state. And in discussions on vulnerability, um, we often equate it with a certain way of talking, a certain way of holding our bodies and so on. When in reality, vulnerability is just about being honest, transparent about where you're struggling and about what you need. And it's not about the facial expression that you're wearing when you say it. It's not about subscribing to you know, a, a script for what you gotta say when you say it. And so how to be vulnerable varies with who you're being vulnerable with. How I'm vulnerable to children is very different from how I'm vulnerable to coworkers, to how I'm vulnerable with my employer, to how I'm vulnerable with my spouse, and so on. And so I, I think the thing that simplifies vulnerability is when you go into those conversations to let yourself off the hook with needing to cry, because vulnerability isn't about what you prove to the other, it's about how you connect with the other, or rather, about the opportunity you give them to connect with the real you. So, let's get particular, if you don't mind. Give me one example that you, you're willing to share of an area that might be a little difficult to be vulnerable with. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, just being prepared for an event, a presentation. So in my mind, I would prepare for it. But, you know, my kind of worst fear is, is just looking stupid in front of people. That would be a vulnerable moment if I just had to get up and wing something. Yep. So the vulnerability is I fear messing up, looking incompetent, and so on. Yep. yep. And, and where, do, where does the struggle with that vulnerability show up? So that's the fact of where you feel vulnerable. Where does the struggle come up with? Are there people you need to share this with and you're scared to say it to them? Or is the struggle just this holds you back from doing those things? I think just naturally just being comfortable in that position. Yeah, so the vulnerability shows up in the form of being more hesitant to do the stuff that you really wanna do, inclined to say no to, say, to stuff you wanna say yes to. Yeah, that's good, man. Well, first of all, let's give this brother a hand for being so vulnerable with just that. Yeah. I mean, this really is one of those instances of the, the, the answer being built into the question itself. You just modeled for us with complete brilliance exactly how to do it. And so I'll just add a couple of things to it. You know, uh, in the spirit of feel the fear and do it anyway, 
uh, one thing I would do is I would just talk with people that I feel safe about it with, right? Th there's nothing wrong with feel feeling scared. Like many of the most competent people still feel the butterflies in their stomach when they do a craft. And so most people will identify with, yeah, I know what that's like. I, you know, that's why I prepare in this way. That's why I show up three hours early. You know, like I, I know plenty of people who their routines all comes down to this is the relationship they've established with their vulnerability. So just having a couple of people that you can feel safe expressing that to. But then I think also part of, part of the, the value of being vulnerable is that it's not just about saying this is where I struggle or this is where I'm weak, but it's also about taking it beyond that and saying this is what I need, right? So vulnerability isn't just, man, I'm having a hard time right now. I can't do this all by myself. Vulnerability is, can, can someone help me? In fact, that's, that's more vulnerable because like, I can't do this all by myself. It's still me kind of holding on to some power, you know, the power to kind of make people feel guilty, the power to manipulate a little bit. But when I, when I say, hey, can somebody help me out? I'm, I'm so wide open. Well, because, the because, is, because some, it's about you, right? Oh, I, yeah. I can't do this by myself. You're still thinking about you versus the other yeah. ways. Can somebody help me? Now it's about them, it's about somebody yeah. else and, and opening yourself up. And I can get rejected, right? Right. When I say that's, I'm tired of doing everything scary. by myself, I, I've got the power right. and, and, and everyone squirms. But when I say, can somebody help me out? Everybody can get quiet on me, mm -hmm. right? So that's the, that's the real vulnerable, vulnerability. So identifying what it is you need and then articulating that need or those needs with the people that you feel safe talking to about it. But man, you, you really did just do it, you know? Yeah. Good stuff. Another question over here. I see a hand up. Hey, my name is Bobby. I have a question for you about, um, you know, you're talking about minimal, minimalism. And for me, you know, I'm, I'm newer to the industry. I'm only 25. And so I don't have as much experience as like majority of you. <laughs> um, my question is, you know, as you're moving up and as you're, you're really leveling up in the work that you do and you're with new people and you only have so much time on your hands, um, how, do you, how do you effectively but politely let go of those people who you're no longer elevating them, they're no longer elevating you, they're more of those energy suckers, maybe it's like old friends that you've known for a while, mm. but you guys aren't on the same level anymore, you're doing different things. How do you minimalize those relationships that aren't really co-elevating? And how do you politely do that and let go and continue to level up? Yeah, the classic uh, Jerry Seinfeld, how do I break up with a friend dilemma? This is a good one. <laughs> so so the, the first thing I'll say regarding the, um, the, the youth and the, the inexperience is that um, every advantage is a disadvantage of some kind and every disadvantage is an advantage of some kind. Every asset is a liability of some kind, and every liability is a potential asset of some kind. And so, you know, if I were to compare being single versus being married, uh, who has the advantage? Uh, both with respect to different things. If you're single and you don't have a spouse and you don't have children, you might have the flexibility to say yes to deals, to come and go as you please, to up and move to New York on a whim, without having any discussions about it or considering anybody else's situation, right? That's a real advantage. At the same time, if you've got family, you have elements that keep you grounded. You have elements that tend to make you more responsible. You tend to be more humane and less selfish, more generous. You also tend to be more holistic in your thinking in certain areas. So, so everything has the advantages and disadvantages. And so I would, I would look at that youth and that inexperience as a as an asset and explore ways that I can do that. I remember my, my first job after college was uh, as a financial advisor with American Express. And I remember when I, when I first came in and began my training, uh, all the guys had worked in sales and I didn't have any sales experience. And my GM was like, I'm so glad you don't have any sales experience because all of these guys have acquired bad habits and I've got to teach them and I just get to work with you from scratch and I, I just get to pour in. So, but they had advantages too that I didn't have. So I would encourage you to look at what aspects of being young and having less experience is an, uh, is an asset. As far as friends, it reminds me of something my mom told me once when, when I was little and, and, and you know, she was talking to me about, um, uh, essentially about living intentionally. And I, and I says, but mom, what, what do I do with friends who don't wanna be that way? And she says, oh baby, don't worry about them. 
If you stay true to yourself, you won't have to leave them. They'll leave you. You don't have to break up with friends that aren't on your level, whatever that is and whatever that means. If you're focused on things, you don't have to sit your friends down and go, hey, y'all, I'm, I'm really focused on my career right now, and I know that you guys only want to focus on this, and I'm just not into that, so maybe we should break up. You don't have to do that. Just continue moving in the direction of what is true, what is good, and what is right for you, and be honest without being disrespectful to them. If they invite you to something that you're not into and that you don't want to go to, you can let them know. And, and, and one, of the, one of the more empowering ways you can say no to people is by letting them know what you're willing to say yes to. So for instance, at the, the restaurant job, right? I, I had um, one of the guests ask if, if, if we had ranch dressing. And I said, no, we don't. And I walked away from the table and my manager says, TK, never do that. Never end your interaction with a customer with no. Next time, say, no, I don't have ranch dressing, but I do have these options. And then they might choose one of those options, but even if they say no thanks, they will feel like they're saying no to themselves, no to some options that you gave them, rather than feel like you're shutting them down. And in a similar way, you can totally tell your friends like, no, I don't want to do that or I'm not interested in that. Hey, but if you ever want to get together and do this, I'm totally game. So think about what are the terms and conditions under which you would be willing to engage those people. Let them know what your yes is. And when it comes to the no, you don't have to get defensive. You don't have to justify yourself. You don't have to get mad at them for asking. But just be, give them a cool, diplomatic, no thanks, keep living your life. And if they want to level up with you, they'll start moving in the direction of what you're willing to say yes to. And if they don't, they'll go their own way. And that's cool, too, because there's no right or wrong about it. You do what's best for you and give them the option of choosing you. Does that help? Do you have a follow-up? Okay. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think that's one of those <clears throat> hard things to grasp is because everybody in this room is so giving. They're like, they love people. They love helping others. And, you know, life, it's like your train ride. And some people are on the train for a few stops, and they're meant to get off eventually, right? And they're not going on the same train as you for the entire ride that you're going to be on. And maybe other people will hop back on somewhere down the road. But you got to be okay with people getting off the train and following their own path a little bit too. That's right. Well, one example for me is like, man, I, I used to be so into basketball. I'm still into it, but like in terms of watching games, I'm just not the person I used to be who's willing to give two hours to a whole lot of basketball games. Maybe if there's a game seven, maybe if the Bulls are doing really good, maybe. Mm -hmm. But like that's a huge investment of time for me. Mm -hmm. Um, two hours on a game, I'm just not really doing it anymore. And I'm not snobbish about it, but I've got a lot of friends who that's the version of TK that they've come to know and love. And when they ask me, you know, hey, you, you want to uh, get together and watch this game? Um, sometimes I, I might say yes for the opportunity to connect, but I don't, I don't say to them, no, man, I'm, I'm not interested in wasting my time. I'm, I'm focused on my, no, I, I, I don't take it there. I go, nah, man, I'm, I'm good. But then I put them in the position to reject me. Like, uh, not I'm, not, I'm not gonna do the game tonight, but hey, let's hook up for coffee next week. And they might go, oh, okay. Or they might say, no, I'm not doing coffee. Okay, cool. But they're gonna reject me because I'm not just gonna say no to something that I don't wanna do. I'm gonna give them the opportunity to accommodate a yes that I will be really happy to, to, to go along with. And so I, I like the Derek Sivers quote where he says, uh, if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. Um, think about what your hell yes is and give yourself the option in life of watching the magic of people surprise you by a willingness to go along with your hell yes. Just give yourself the, that chance. Love it. What's up, bro? Hey, how's it going? Good having you here, man. TK, uh, my name is... Oh, microphone. Hello? Got hey, TK. What's up, brother? My name is Sonny. First off... Um, just gotta let you know, I think you're the best storyteller that I've ever listened to. You're amazing. So kudos. Amazing. I mean, you're, you're I very believe. gracious. I felt you're like I gracious. was in that room with you and your grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're so. very gracious. Um, so for me personally, I, I really do feel that's lacking in my life is that minimus mentality. And I'm a, I'm a habit guy, and so I wanna get a little practical. Are there any daily routines, weekly routines that you do to get you in that mindset? Anything. 
Yeah, so uh, daily walking. Uh, not walking to some place as a practical matter, not walking for exercise, although that may be a secondary benefit, but taking a walk. Walking is kind of like a mantra for the body. And uh, the, way, the way I like to think about it is if you, if you go to the, the ocean on a windy day, right, and, and you look at the water, what you will see is the, the, the waves, the wind beating against the water, and, and you just see the surface, right? But suppose you go back to that ocean on a day where it's really calm, and you look at the water, now you can see deep. And you can look down and you see that that ocean is teeming with life, right? And, and so it is with the human soul. It's like, you know, when the, when the mind is clouded by a whole bunch of thoughts, by the busyness of tackling the to-do list and getting things done, we can only see so deeply into our own souls. But when you do something like take a walk, which is kind of an easier transition than than meditation, because so many people have so many hangups about traditional meditation, which I also believe in as well. Um, but, but walking is a little bit easier because you don't have to stand still, you don't have, to, you don't have all that going on. But, but not being on the phone, not texting, not calling anybody, not listening to any music, but giving yourself like 15 minutes. Just try it, try it for like a week of taking 15 minutes a day and just going for a walk and see what happens to your mind. I, I, I believe what you will begin to experience is a sort of settling down of thoughts and you'll begin to look inside and you'll be like whoa there's some deep stuff down there so like yeah a, so like a meditation walk where you're just intentionally aware of everything around you is that something like that that you do yeah um i, I forget this rabbi's name but he called it noble boredom Right? So like, I, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even put the label meditation walk on it because that might trip you up and make you feel like, am I doing it right? I would just take a walk and you're not going to a place and you're not on your phone, you're not listening to music. Just take a walk with you. If you and I were getting ready, gonna take a walk together, we wouldn't call it a meditation walk, we wouldn't put a label on it, we just take a walk together, do that, but with yourself. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I, the biggest breakthroughs I've, I've had in thought and, and ideas and business and stuff is me walking in the woods or walking on the beach. Just be, me being in nature, just going for a walk without any distractions, yep. and all of a sudden things start clicking uh, because a lot of the other noise gets yeah. gets uh, calmed down, and you can focus on the things that are actually, you know, high priority for you. Um, I love your question, Sunny. Are there are there other habits where you beyond taking a walk, right, and, and getting the minimalism in, from the mindset standpoint. But what about like, I don't know, do you look at your calendar and say, hey, here's all the things where I'm spending my time, you know, one of the things that I've done is, here's how I spend my time, yep. what makes me happy? I drew a smiley face next to a whole bunch of line items and I drew frowny faces because it didn't make me happy. And that created awareness around where was I spending my time? What did I want to do more of or not want to do, right, and, yep. and remove? Right? Are there any other uh, tactics, techniques, or, or habits that, that you pursue on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual type of uh, basis in order to, I don't know, look at life, right? Like, here's, yeah. here's what I'm doing with my time, here's what I'm doing with my relationships, here's what I'm doing with, you know, things, here's, like, uh, anything along those lines. A absolutely. So, like, in, in addition to the, the weekly calendar review, which usually for me is on Sundays, right, where I look at the week that's coming up, um, Every night, I, I look at the calendar for the, the next day, and I ask myself, is, are these habits, or is this something that I still wanna do, right? Because there are things we choose to do that we can easily feel victims about, and it's reflected in our language. Hey, I gotta go to work, right? Like, I, I, I got, man, I, I gotta take my kid. And it's like, no, like, like, based on my own priorities, I'm choosing to do these things because they give me joy, but over time, I become disconnected from my why, and so they become things I feel compelled to do by some external force. And so I like to look at that next day coming up and say, like, do I want to do everything here? And then I got to tell myself, like, okay, like, why is this for you? This is a meeting that somebody else called, and you're choosing to attend, so you either got to be honest and, and, and come up with a no, or tell yourself, like, what's the empowering story here? So that's something that I, that I think is important that I like to do. Um, but yeah, man, in, in, any, any way that I can free up the space for me to get to my own mind 
before other people and other things get to my mind, the more I'm available to other people and valuable to them when I get to them and they get to me, you know? And so any, anything in those directions, whether it's walks, calendar review, um, not taking my phone into the bathroom, right? Not taking it to bed, you know, little things like that. They, they add up because it's not about, oh, I'm better than anybody else for doing this. Oh, I'm, I'm a bad person uh, if I do do that. No, it has nothing to do with that. It's just about freeing up that space for, for, for energy, you know? And that's where all the magic comes from. There, there's a quote by Speed Levitch who says, uh, there are secret spaces inside the human heart that know nothing of the outside world. Your job is to establish a relationship with the outside world that gives you the freedom to unearth the treasures that are in those secret spaces. We've been out of time for two minutes, so I wanna respect you all. I'll still be here for a little bit, so if anybody wants to chat with me or anything like that, just, just come talk with me. I'd love to meet some of you all. This is my first time being at this legacy thing. So um, appreciate you, Tim. Thanks for having me be a part hey, of this, brother. Hey, one of my favorite modern-day philosophers. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you, Mike. Thank you, brother.